is creativity? If I were to ask you, what is creativity? I'm going to pick on you. How would you define it? Uh, don't know. How would you? That's okay. How, how would you define creativity? Can you? What's creativity mean to you? Anyone? What's that? Imagination. Imagination. Okay. Anyone else? Unique. Unique. Thinking outside the box, one of the most common definitions, right? <laughs> Some people think that creativity is something like this. If you dress a certain way, if you act a certain way, then you're going to be perceived as creative. I ask that question to students, to uh, professionals all the time. And if I were to go around and force you guys, every one of you, to give me a definition, how you define creativity would be different with every one of you guys because it's a very internal kind of a personal thing. So if we go back here, thinking outside the box, here we go. If we go here, and I were to tell you what my definition of creativity is, I hate that term thinking outside. Who said that? <laughs> thinking outside the box. What I'd like to do is sometimes I think you got to take that box and then you got to just smash the crap out of it. And then you got to take it and rip it up. And then you got to take it and bury it. Maybe throw some water on it and see what grows. To me, that's what creativity is about. Not thinking outside the box, but breaking that box. That's just me. <laughs> Let me give you guys more of a clinical <coughs> definition of creativity to help you kind of understand, put that in perspective. So this definition comes actually from a Harvard professor by the name of Teresa Motley. And Teresa Motley has been studying creativity for pretty much her entire career. Boy, takes a lot out of you. <laughs> her definition, a responsible judge as creative to the extent that it's both novel and appropriate, useful, correct, or valuable response to the task at hand, and the task is, Heuristic rather than algorithmic. And by the look of your eyes, this is what you're all thinking, huh? So let me kind of break that down for you, and I'll kind of help you explain what that means, and then we'll go back and take a second quick look at it. And the two terms in there that you really have to know about are algorithmic and heuristic. Do you have any math majors in here? Anyone who loves geometry, physics? Me neither. That's why I was a writer. Algorithm is basically, you guys are going to be able to impress people at the next party you go to, by the way. You're going to have so many facts when you walk out of here. Don't blow your mind. Okay. Algorithm is a complete mechanical rule for solving a problem. Has ever bought anything from Ikea, right? And you look at those instructions, take this, put that there, do it this way, tighten it in 30 degrees. That's algorithmic. If I were to walk straight up to you, that's the algorithmic way of getting to you, okay? Does everyone get that? Heuristic is an incomplete rule of thumb or guideline that can lead to learning. So if I wanted to go see him, I wouldn't just walk up to him, I come by here and say, hey, how you doing? Hey, what's up? Hey, let me take your hand. There you go. Over here. Am I doing okay? Doing all right. Okay. <laughs> Everything good? Hi. Hi. Oh, hey. Okay. So that was the heuristic approach to getting to him. Kind of no plan, just going off. And in life, work, and school, Problems are really are rarely going to be algorithmic, right? We 
and you guys get a school project, do you guys know exactly how you're going to attack it and finish it? Probably not. <coughs> Three kids I have in college. Three kids. <coughs> and two stepkids, five of them. They have no idea what's happening. Really do. But one of them does. Really algorithmic. So understanding the heuristic approach is really important. So when we go back to Dr. Mobley's definition of creativity, hopefully, we'll take another look at that and break that down for you again. So we look at this robust judge institute as creative, right? Creativity, the extent that it's both Novel and appropriate. So, <clears throat> novel and appropriate. Um, you're not creative just for creativity's sake. There's a method to the madness. Appropriate. It's useful. It's got a use for it. Correct or valuable response to the task at hand. So it solves some kind of problem that you're trying to solve. And finally, task is heuristic rather than algorithmic. The process of creativity, you've got to kind of open up your mind, your brain, to kind of go on this scenic journey along the way. How many of you guys would consider yourselves to be kind of outside box thinkers like that? I hope not, I said it. Creative thinkers like that. No one, no one in here thinks they're creative? Come on. Everyone is creative. It's just how you manifest that creativity, okay? You don't have to be an imagineer or anything like that. There's some pretty creative accountants out there, probably in jail, <laughs> but they're out there. It doesn't matter what you do, everyone brings creativity to their life and to their work. So, stop it. So that brings us to thinking like an Imagineer. And this is where I want to get you guys to kind of open up your minds, be a little free. We're in college, you can do that, it's okay. I won't tell your parents. One of the first places I like to start, and this is called the impossibility question. I actually stole this from another consultant, a guy by the name of Joel Barker. And he came up with this question that he calls the impossibility question. And I was exposed to this first when I was um, in, in uh, college myself, just a couple of years ago. He's laughing. And to me, this is just a wonderful question to always kind of be asking yourself, especially if you're given a project to work on or a task to do. And, well, what year are most of you guys in here? Freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors? How many are freshmen? No, sophomores, sophomores, juniors, seniors. Okay, so you guys are ready to get the heck out of here, right? And go earn some money, maybe. <laughs> impossibility question. What's impossible to do in your business today but if it could be done, would be fundament, would, would fundamentally change it for the better. And the thing that makes it such a great question, there are a couple things that make this a really powerful question. The first thing is that you gotta look at, think about what's impossible to do. So if you're trying to come up with an idea for a new product, a new service, a new way to do something, what's something that can't be done? How can you differentiate yourself from the competition? And we're not talking about things that maybe have been done or been done somewhere else, but I can't do it because I don't have, I mean, impossible to be done. You know, can humans fly? I don't know. Can pigs fly? I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that would happen when it starts to pick, you know, pick the trees are walking up. Um, no, what's impossible to do? But if you could do it, would fundamentally change it for the better. And that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of mindset that we as Imagineers always have, going to work with. If we're trying to come up with the land of Pandora or Galaxy's Edge that they're building right now for Star Wars, in 
and even going way back before that, you have to be able to think of how to make the impossible possible. And there are always ways to do it. There are always ways to do it. That's one thing that Disney is wonderful at, at doing, is finding ways to make the impossible possible. <clears throat> How do you come up with impossible ideas and solutions to those impossible ideas? Well, here's a story. There was a guy, he lived in a big city, he had everything he could want. He had a big house, big salary, big car, great wife and family, and blah, blah, blah. But he wasn't happy. Just couldn't figure out why he wasn't happy. <clears throat> so he decides to sell everything he owned and to go on a journey because he heard of this monk in Asia that had the answer to what his happiness is. How can I succeed in life? So he goes over to Asia, he spends months, and he's going to these little villages in Tibet and Bangkok and you know, all over throughout, trying to find this monk. And eventually, he hikes up this tall mountain, gets through the clouds, and he comes to this small village, and there's this little old man sitting in the village meditating. And he realizes that this is the guy he's been looking for. So he goes up to him and he says, Master, I'm honored to finally have found you to meet you. I understand that you have the answers to happiness, to success, how I can make my life better. And he says, I'm, I, I've sold everything. I want to stay here for as long as it takes so that I can become your disciple and you can teach me. And the monk looks up at him and he says, young man, I appreciate you coming all this way. I will be happy to teach you what I know. But this is only going to take a few minutes because there are only three things that you need to know to succeed in life. And I'm going to tell you what those are right now. The first thing is you need to pay attention. The second thing you need to know that you have to pay attention. And the third thing that you need to know is what? Pay attention. Sounds kind of simple, huh? But as you, my wife would tell you, plenty of us go through life kind of oblivious to what's going on around us. I never listened to my wife. Pay attention. For me, a big part of paying attention has to do with this concept that I call creative cross-pollination. It's about taking two things that don't have anything to do with each other and trying to connect the dots and put them together, okay? Any of you guys ever do that before? Solve a problem? college time here, but <laughs> then my wife will wake up for like three in the morning, and then they get going. It's all about creative cross-pollination, taking two things that don't have anything to do with each other. Now, creative cross-pollination is something that I've been talking about for a long, long time, and for me, this is something that is innate in all of us. It's something that we're kind of born with. If you go back to our great, you know, ancestor Ugg in the cave, when he was trying to tell stories, he would take a burnt ember and use that to draw in his cave. And then later he would go out and find um, clays and, and pigments and kind of mash them together to make a paint so he could communicate. Humans have been doing this forever throughout the history. It's something that's very innate. <clears throat> One of the reasons
reasons that we're able to create them cost holiday is because all of us have these mental filing cabinets. And I think creative people have bigger ones than you know those who would concern themselves non-creative. Size counts when it comes to creativity. Okay. Mental filing cabinets. Creative people will walk into a room, they'll see the pattern in the carpet, they'll smell something, they'll hear something, they make observations, and it just kind of gets filed away. I think we tend to be pack rats, physical and mental pack rats. How many of you guys are pack rats? Keep stuff like forever. I can't throw stuff out. Raising three kids, I mean, all the toys that broke, I love like blinky things and things that make sound and flash. And so like one of their little toys, I would like take it apart and keep the little flashy thing, stick it in the garage. I would keep, you know, whatever stuff from work, I go to trade shows and get like swag, you know, that no one would in their right mind ever want to keep, but for some reason I can't throw it out. And my wife always like, clean out the garage. I'm like, I'm not going to clean out the garage. She's like, you don't need this stuff. I'm like, yes, I do. What do you need it for? I don't know, but I need it. And then eventually, just to make her happy, because happy wife, long life, right? I'll go in there, I'll clean out the garage. And what happens as soon as I clean out the garage, that's when I need my little blinky thing because I just threw it out. Thanks. <laughs> we do the same thing up here. We, we observe, we, we see, we smell, we use our senses, right? And we pack that stuff away, not knowing why we're going to need it or when, but knowing that at some point it's going to come back to serve us. I'll show you some examples. What would these two things have in common? And we'll want to take a shot. Firefighting, lawn, and garden care. No idea? Okay. How about this? Fire hose, combine that with a garden hose. How many of you guys have ever seen these? A flat garden hose. Great invention. Right? This is another one. You guys should be able to figure this one out, relate to this one. Inflatable wrap in the core. What would you get? Cross pollinate those. Inflatable coolers. There it takes a professor to answer that one. So you guys are shame. Inflatable coolers. You ever seen those? They're great. You got a whole good river here. Yeah, do, can you go tubing down the rivers around here? No? <laughs> no, I went to University of Florida for a couple of years for the games where we have the Interesting Country River and you get your inner tubes and then you get your inflatable cooler filled with ice and beer and not <coughs> beer, I mean water and soft drinks. <laughs> this one steam room in a convention how many of you guys ever been in a sauna right you're sitting in there baking and some some person probably was in there baking away going man i feel like a freaking piece of chicken or something <laughs> so they came up with the idea of the steam oven to cook food that's all cross pollination two things that seemingly don't have anything to do with each other and somehow they do i'll give you one more See if you can figure this one out. A fierce tiger and tigger. What would you get? You guys can't figure that out? Come on, pouncer. <laughs> <laughs> this is the University of Memphis, right? <laughs>
don't grow up. Some of you may not have anyway, but or may not <laughs> intend to. But I'm telling you here now, don't grow up. I think creative people, the best of us, have got what I call this Peter Pan syndrome. You don't want to grow up. And there's a big advantage to that. I think creative people need to be able to like look at the world through a kid's eyes. Because kids ask like remarkable questions, right? I mean if you guys have like little brothers or cousins or nephews or whatever. And they'll but just out of the blue come out with these like amazing questions. I remember one time when my daughter was a uh, little girl, I was going up to Boston. And we couldn't afford it, you know. I mean, my kids, my, my youngest, she's uh, 19 now, my middle one's 22. Neither one of them has seen snow ever. Yeah. I was 19 before I saw snow. So I'm going up to Boston, and my daughter looks at me and she goes, Dad, it's going to be snowing up there. I'm like, Yeah, I'm sure it will be. This is in the wintertime. And she's like, why is the snow white? Oh, that's a good question. You can pay her imaginary kind of person. I was I'm trying to have some kind of perfectly reasonable answer. But Lord knows I'm not a decision maker. My middle son is. I don't know where he got that from. <laughs> Look at the world through his eyes. Playing is really important. <coughs> and don't let people tell you otherwise. How many of you are in Dr. Cody's class here? You guys get to play in his class? Anybody you play? Tell him you want playtime next time you're in there. <laughs> tell him the Imagineer said was okay. Especially when he gives you a tough project because creative thoughts often come in these unguarded moments. They don't occur of you guys have ever been to a party? Okay, we'll start there because I'm not going to assume anything. How many of you guys have ever been to a party? Okay, good. Okay. So, ever been to a party? You look across the room, you're talking to your buddy, and someone starts walking towards you that you've known for like two, three years at school, and you can't remember their name. And they're getting closer, and you're trying harder remember their name and you're going, oh God, please don't come over here. And then you get that like really weird awkward silence thing because you're hoping that they'll just kind of stick their hand out and introduce themselves, right? Hi, my name is Lana. But that doesn't happen and you're sitting there sweating now and your eyes are like beady and you're like trying to, and you can't, and then they walk away and they go, oh, you schmuck, why didn't you introduce me? And they're mad at you. And as soon as they walk away, what happens? You remember their name. The harder you are, the more stressed out you are. When do your best <coughs> ideas typically come, guys? The best question for you. Do they come when you're like right there in the moment trying to think of something and pour something? How many get great ideas like in the shower? You know, at nighttime when you're just chilling out, when you're out with your friends? Go to parties, depending on what they're serving at the party. Because you're relaxed. Find time to play. I tell that to corporations all the time. This is why sometimes you'll hear about them taking people out on these like charrettes and you know these field trips and stuff. <clears throat> I do a special uh, thing for, for I, I just had a pharmaceutical team come down from Atlanta, 10 people, their innovation team, and they spent two days. The first day, took them into Epcot, and I gave them a scavenger hunt, and they went around, and they um, did some really kind of fun exercises, got to ride, you know, the rides and stuff. Then the second day was all about taking all of that fun stuff in connecting the dots back to the projects that they were working on. And all of a sudden the innovations, the things that they were stuck on, you know, they were able to kind of get past those humps. So find time to play. Very
very, very important. Okay? Don't grow up. You want to see what happens when Imagineers play? The answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to, yeah, sure. Okay. This was a kid's area that was at the Disney Studios. How many of you guys remember the movie, the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Is that, yeah, it's kind of withstood the test of time, because I think it probably came out before a lot of you guys were born, at least, or when you were young. So the idea is, honey, I talk to kids. Wayne, Wayne Zakowski, the crazy dad professor, shrinks his uh, family down to the size of ants, and he's got to go find them. So we did a play area that was based on honey, I shrunk the kids. And when you walked in, you were actually shrunk down to the size of ants. So you're walking around these blades of grass and these giant paper clips and um, Play-Doh cans. It was a giant dog nose you could walk up to that would sniff you, and it would actually like sneeze on you and get stuff on you. It was really fun. Kids like that. So we came up with this Honey, I Trunk the Kids play area, and one day I'm sitting at my desk, and one of my buddies comes up to me, my colleagues comes up to me, one of the art directors, he says, Brian, come with me. Whenever that happened, I knew it was like something. One thing about working in Imagineering is that you never knew what was going to happen on any given day. And when weird stuff happened, it was usually going to be weird stuff. So this guy, he's like, come with me, Brian. Like, What's up? He's like, well, I've designed a sign for Honey, I Trump the Kids. And we need to, like, send it to, um, you know, the, the, the design people to actually sketch out the art, you know, the forms, you know, the blueprints and stuff to make it. I said, I want to show it to you. So I, I'm expecting to go outside and see this giant sign that he made. We go outside, there's a little, it's a little like a uh, uh, paperweight thing in the shape of a paper clip and it's got like a little piece of paper in there, right there. Like, well, why don't you send that to him? He's like, well, because that won't show him exactly like the scale and everything. So I need you to stand about 20 feet back there. And then he took this picture. And this is the little paper clip, the little desktop paper clip that he made. That, I don't know who that young guy is with the hair. He's laughing. Yeah, laugh, laugh. Someday. <laughs> anyway, that's the picture he took. He took that by using a very common technique that Imagineers use called forced perspective. Have you guys ever heard about forced perspective? Forced perspective is a technique that we use to make things look artificially bigger or smaller. And there are a lot of different ways we accomplish it. This one's done with photographs. So we stuck this literally on a table, kind of like this. And I was probably about, I don't know, 15 feet back like this, pointing at that. And when the picture came out, we got the uh, picture of the sun. I thought that was kind of neat. Here's another one. How many of you guys Star Wars fans? Right? Galaxy's Edge coming out. It's going to be amazing. They've actually built a full-size Millennium Falcon. Not for real cool. When you go in there, <coughs> they, they've got a hotel that they're building. How many of you guys ever watched Westworld? Any of you guys watch Westworld? You got binge watch Westworld, guys. Awesome, awesome show. Westworld, you know, robots become sentient and they take over the theme park and they start killing all the guests. But when you go in there, when you go to Westworld, you, they, they give you all the clothes and accoutrements and everything to just walk around like you're in the Wild West. Well, Star Wars, Gal Galaxy's Edge, it's gonna be the same thing. They're gonna give you Jedi robes or Sith robes. And you're gonna see all these people walking, and you won't be able to tell the guests from the host. Trust me, binge watch Westworld. The first couple, until you get past the first couple episodes, they're kind of confusing. But once you get past them, it's great. Anyway, so this was Star Tours at the Disney Studios. One day, my buddy 
comes up to me, my art director friend, he says, hey, come with me. Okay, he says, what? He said, well, they've asked me to put together some photo opportunities for the guests, and before they decide which ones they want to do, they want to mock them up. And so I need to take some pictures to show them what they're gonna look like. So I'm like, okay. So the first thing we did was we went over on the back lot of the studios and they had a whole bunch of these uh, cards from the movie Dick Tracy. You guys ever remember that? They did live live action version of Dick Tracy um, back in like the 19, I don't know, 90s or something. And we had all these cards with bullet holes and stuff. So it gives me a fedora and it gives me a Tommy gun and like stand and they get out of the smoke machine all of a sudden the place just starts going up in smoke and he's like okay look like a gangster I'm like okay so I take some pictures of me like Dick Tracy um, around the cars then we go over to Indiana Jones and he gives me Indiana Jones fedora and he says go up and make it leave like you're getting the, the gold idol like in the movie so we do that and I take a couple pictures like that and then we go over to Star Tours and this is where it got really cool you guys aren't Star Wars fans? No one? No? So I'm, I'm just going to be impressing myself here. <laughs> but if you ever saw uh, The Empire Strikes Back, <coughs> excuse me, which takes place on the planet Endor with the little Ewoks, right? Little furry guys. And there's a scene where the stormtroopers are chasing uh, Luke and Leia through the forest on these land speeders. And at Disney, one of the cool things about working there is we had all kinds of great relationships. So one of the relationships we had was with um, Lucasfilm. And they actually sent us some of the actual props from that movie, including a couple land speeders. We just happened to have one lying around. So my buddy had grabbed one and he stuck it on the workhorses. And he said, get on there, make believe you're going to the forest of Endor. So that's me on one of the actual props from the movie. And then this was the, uh, years later, um, the uh, mock-up that we did for the photo opportunity. I don't know who either of those guys are, but um, they look good, so I thought. <laughs> anyway, so that's what happens in Imagineers play. One thing that is really important is being able to our guests focus. And I want to go through a couple of techniques real quick on how we do that too, and kind of show you in part some of the, the techniques that, that we use to keep our guests focused. So the first one here, number six, is to set expectations at the beginning. If you've ever been to a Disney theme park, one of the things that, if you've ever been to any park, one of the things that people hate doing is just standing in line, right? So one of the projects that um, I helped with was theming out the queue area for the Jungle Cruise. How many of you guys have ridden on the Jungle Cruise, right? One of my favorite rides. And when you're standing in line, <clears throat> we went through and we created this whole bunch of little story that starts before you even get on the boats. And basically you're in this like outpost and at the Jungle Cruise Training Company and you're just surrounded by all these different props. My, my biggest contribution was I wrote a bunch of, there's this radio broadcast that comes in over the loudspeakers when you're standing in line, Albert Awal, the voice of the uh, Jungle Navigation Company, it, and I wrote a lot of his shtick. But the idea though is that you want to get guests immersed right away and set their expectations. The next technique I call going zen is to pre-visualize what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it. And this holds true for a lot of projects too. When my kids were in high school and actually even once they got to college, obviously had to write a lot of papers. And one of the techniques I would always tell them about with that paper is, you know, before you sit down and you start actually <coughs> write anything, really kind of think about what the story is that you want to tell in that paper and actually do like a little outline, which 
just like the main points. And if you can do that, then this paper is going to pretty much write itself because you're going to know, you're going to have visualized what's going to be coming out and, and what's going to be going on in that paper. This is something I did for the Great Movie Ride. Have you guys ever been on Great Movie Ride? A couple? Okay. Not getting you guys. Okay. I'm going to be like Oprah Winfrey. Everyone's coming to Disney. <laughs> So, actually, the great movie rides are closed, so, ah, just kidding. <laughs> um, one thing I did, so, the great movie ride, basically, it's your inside, uh, it's, it's attraction, you these cars um, that have about 20 people on them, and you're kind of riding through, inside, through what looks like, kind of like movie sets from famous movies. And at one point, your car gets hijacked, depending on which car you're in, your car will get hijacked either by someone who's like a gangster character or a bandit, right? So, uh, I put together these backstories for those characters. Uh, this is the gangster. And th this isn't anything that the guests would see. This was for the cast members themselves to look at and say, you know, uh, Muggsy is a classic prohibition era broke a la John Dillinger. And according to police records, Ravi goes back to the days of when he was a kid, scamming tourists. And it kind of goes through his life of who he was. And the reason we do that is because you've got a lot of different cast members playing that role. Men, women, you know. And some of them are be better actors than, than others. But in order to give a consistent show to the guests, we wanted to put these out there so that they could read them and they could kind of get in the head of who they're playing, and down below you all see, we even put like uh, performance notes in there. Don't speak with a strong gangster a accent. Some people thought they had to sound like, you know, they came from the south side of Chicago, and it just sounded bad, okay? So pre-visualize, kind of get an idea before you present yourself to guests or before you present yourself, you know, maybe before you do your paper or before your project. Number four, create a different and engaging environment. Again, at Disney, I don't really need to say a whole lot about that, especially if you've been there, because you know they're experts at doing that. Probably the most recent example is Pandora, right down in uh, the Animal Kingdom. But everywhere you go, we try and immerse you in the sights and sounds and smells, all that kind of stuff of an engaging environment. I talk to a lot of teachers, and this is something that I talk to teachers about, is creating an engaging environment in your classroom, using lighting, using smells, using different techniques to kind of dress up the classroom to make it more um, enticing, I guess, for the students and, and kind of give them a little bit different atmosphere to help them learn. Okay, time wise? Okay. okay. Number three, keep the cast members moving. Interaction is really important. You know, we talk about guest service a lot. I think if uh, Kevin Williams, w Wilson, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Wilson, is that right? Kevin's Wilson. Kevin's Wilson. I get that name right. Especially here. I think if. I, I don't know if he ever knew Walt Disney or not. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But I would think that the two of them would probably have gotten along very well. In the hotel I'm staying in Park Street, they have list of it is, uh, what is it, uh, how to plant a garden, idea tips for planting a garden, and some of the things that he had in there. Uh, are you guys familiar? Have you guys got garden planting advice from Kevin Wilson? Have you guys ever seen that before? It's a wonderful little sign up there, and it kind of sums up his philosophy of, uh, towards business, some tips. Things like plant five rows of peas, preparedness, providence, perseverance, politeness, and prayer. Three rows of squash, squash gossip, squash criticism, squash indifference. Five rows of lettuce, let us love one another, let us be faithful, let us be loyal, let us be unselfish, and let us be truthful. And finally, three rows of turnips. Turn up for church, turn up for new idea. And this last one, 
turn up with the determination to do a better job tomorrow than you did today. I think a lot of those are very similar to the culture that Disney um, perpetuates within their organization. And entertaining guests is a big part of that. So to keep guests, uh, the cast members moving, this is actually a custodian in one of the parks. And I don't know if you can really kind of make this out here for the cowboy soon, but that's actually his mop dips in the water and they taught the custodian how to paint the Disney characters with water on the ground. It's really cool. Um, you can go on YouTube and see videos of it, but they do a really cool job with it. Um, great movie ride we talked about uh, where the cast members are constantly moving back and forth. It just kind of keeps you off guard a little bit, keeps you focused on the show that's happening. And it's next to that, in addition, is keep the guests moving as well. Keep them kind of off guard a little bit. Pick out the little kid, let him walk with the stormtroopers, or you know, pick out the little girl to be princess for a day. Keep the guests moving, keep them going, keep them engaged. And the last one is let technology enhance the show. So with Disney, there's all kinds of technology that they use from magic bands, which are amazing to these are like little LED lights that are embedded within the concrete in um, uh, Epcot that point in one night. You guys have all seen the, the ghost inside the haunted mansion. But the thing with all this technology is that you don't want to use technology just for technology's sake, and you don't want it to like overshadow the show. You want it to enhance the show. And that's true of a lot of things, you know, when you're making a decision to use, whether it's technology or, you know, a technique or whatever it may be, make sure that you're not doing it just, you know, for its own sake. You're not being creative just for creativity's sake, right? Going back to that definition, that it's relevant to the task at hand. And the final thought with all this is that I think by focusing on how to think like an Imagineer, if you bring that with you to, to class every day, if you bring that with you to relationships, to life every day, <clears throat> thinking like an Imagineer, you can make profound changes not just get new techniques, but actually make profound techniques pay attention, right? On how you approach life, and beyond that, school, and ultimately business and your jobs. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, wow, I guess I said it all. <laughs> if anyone wants to get a hold of me, I am more than accessible by, you know, this is my information here. You can email me, you can, you know, link up with me. I like to be liked, I like to be followed. I'm kind of weird that way. So follow me on Twitter, follow me on Pinterest. I'm Creative Brian on Pinterest. Um, is that, do you ever forgot you use Facebook anymore? Is that one, Facebook is like going away to dinosaur for young guys, young people today, right? So I sound even, I probably just sound a little talking. But anyway, if you are on Facebook, join the Facebook next door. But I'd welcome any of you guys to connect with me and follow. follow. So we have any questions here? Um, yeah. Is there any um, type of customer validation or customer discovery you guys do to ensure the attractions that you are conceptualizing will be well received by your guests? So you're talking about doing the police car process and all that. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of research that gets done before a concept will actually um, go from the blue sky phase um, into the actual execution of it. Um, Disney itself has got, separate from Imagineering, they've got a whole research side, a whole research team that does a ton of research and stuff for us. So yeah, there's, there's quite a bit. Never asked me that one yet. 
I think something really interesting um, for these students is a lot of these students, whether in sport or hospitality, are going to be working behind the scenes, yeah. much like you. And so a lot of what they do will not necessarily be seen by the people attending a game or watching on television. So right. one of the things that stood out to me when you were talking is um, you're talking about building a story right. while a person's standing in line. Right. And it, it's a great way to keep people engaged and kind of take their mind off of standing in line. However, there's also a lot of people who they just want to get to the ride. Yeah. Right. So they don't pay attention to any of that stuff. So from your perspective, yeah. What? How is it to kind of create these stories, knowing that only a portion of the people right. who are quote unquote consuming those are actually consuming them? Yeah, that's a good question too. So I'll give you an example of a project I worked on that kind of addresses that um, and cross pollinates in, in, into your question. Um, I've been working for the last year with an instructor at a college over in England. And he works with young adults who are on the autism spectrum. And a lot of these uh, students, um, you know, they're functional, but they still have emotional um, ups and downs and stuff. So what he came to me and he said, I want to create a sensory room where these students can go and they can kind of chill out and relax if they need a break. And he's a huge Disney fan. So he comes over to Orlando maybe a couple times a year. So he came over and I walked him through the park. And the purpose of that was to show him different techniques that we use to engage our guests and immerse our guests. I showed him how we use lighting. You know, a lot of stuff I talked about, smells, colors, um, projection mapping, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of teachers have kind of asked me about this too, and, and I talked to them about it. When you first start talking about that, the knee-jerk reaction is that, well, that's great, Disney's got like a zillion dollars, they can afford to do all that. I'm a little poor teacher, I don't have any budget, I can't do it. But there are things that you can do very inexpensively, and I'm going to go back to your question here, very inexpensively to create those same kind of techniques and environments. It doesn't cost anything to take out uh, a plain white light bulb and put in a colored light bulb, or to go to uh, the drugstore, CVS, and buy the plain plugins, you know, things like that. Put in a black light, you know, to change the environment within a building. And the reason that I wanted to show them all these different techniques is that when you're dealing with people who are on the autism spectrum, they all react to different stimuli in different ways. Some of them are sensory, some of them are more audio, some of them are more affected by smells. And it's the same thing when you're creating an environment for the guests, you wanna try and use as many techniques, if you will, to kind of engage them. So not everyone, like when you're in the Winnie the Pooh queue, for example, um, which they redid not long ago, there's stuff you can touch. There's stuff, very bright, colorful, comic-like graphics that you can read. There's sounds that you can listen to that kind of, you know, like in the Jungle Cruise too, the, the radio broadcasts. Not everyone's going to into that, but some people find that kind of funny. I don't know why, unless they're out here writer. And they'll tune into that. So, you know, what, what you try and do is try and, you know, create a little something for everyone. And usually there are ways to do that. Good question. Anyone else? Yeah. What was your career development? Oh my lord. Well, Jeff right off the coast of Africa, I was raised by apes, saw the movie. <laughs> um, so I always knew from a young age that I liked to write. Um, and I was always kind of creative. My dad was an attorney, my mom mom was the more kind of creative one, so I would say maybe I got some of that from her. But I always loved to write. I was one of those guys that uh, kind of a year like this, yeah, I would turn paper due the next day, sit down the day before, write the thing, and get an A on it. Is anyone good like that? People hated me in college. But I could 
sit down the night before term paper was due and write the paper and get an A on it. So I always, you know, when I got into college and I had to start thinking about what I want to be, number one was astronaut. I wasn't going to have it. Number two was, boy, this had a great word for that place, Disney. And so my degree was actually in advertising, and I always thought I would be an advertising copywriter. Um, but I actually wound up, my first job was in Miami working as a video producer. Um, actually, before producing, I was hired as a script writer. So my first job was as a writer. Uh, and from there, I started learning how to uh, uh, produce and direct. And um, after one full year, the, our main client went bankrupt, Eastern Airlines. I don't know if any of you guys ever even remember them. But they, they used to be major airlines. They went bankrupt. So I've got a whole year of experience. I'm thinking, well, I'll just go up to Disney. They'll hire me. They'll give me that big corner office and look like in the Magic Kingdom, right? And they're like, not so fast, hotshot. And my first job was actually in the hospitality industry at the front desk of the Contemporary Resort. I was checking guests in. But it was right before the studios opened up, so my timing was really good. And I was able to start getting out there and um, working as a production assistant. And then I just started kind of <coughs> in the company doing some other stuff. And 